the UN now uh, is in a position uh, where it has reached, I think, more than 700,000 people with everything from cash assistance to food assistance, but we know it is nowhere near enough. And we also know very specifically that Russia's tactics of encircling cities where civilians are living and bombarding them uh, creates real access issues for the humanitarian groups that, that we fund. And so that really is, is our biggest challenge. I've spent a lot of time on the phone today uh, with various humanitarian organizations who are perched and ready to put food in into the town. And not just food, as you know, medicines have run short. Uh, water is inaccessible in, in many parts of the city. Um, and But the, the, again, as you said, the challenge has been that while the Ukrainian government has been uh, very, very eager to create safe passage and uh, you know, to uh, have a ceasefire in order for food and supplies to get in, the Russian Federation has shown that it uh, wants to approach Mariupol as it at once with the Syrian government approached Aleppo. Um, and, and that is all we have seen from them, despite uh, countless promises. There have been heartbreaking scenes of Ukrainians in Mariupol being told that humanitarian pauses were going to occur, showing up often with elderly, with children, you know, as a mother, I can't even imagine, showing up and then the shelling starts. Obviously, the United States and the Euro European Union countries, along with Japan and Australia and democracies around the world, are imposing very steep costs on the Russian Federation's economy and on President Putin and his cronies. Uh, so we need China, we need Beijing, we need India, we need, uh, you know, countries that have maintained uh, friendly ties or neutral ties with the Russian Federation to be raising their voices on behalf of this urgent, desperate humanitarian need. And we will be ready. The humanitarian groups are ready. USAID has supported them in scaling up their assistance. They are ready to go. There is one thing that stands in the way, and that is President Biden. Well, let me say that when President Zelensky came before our Congress, and he's been an incredible spokesperson for the needs and welfare of the Ukrainian people, you know, he also made the same the same request. But but he he also said, you know, I understand. Uh, I've heard the arguments, and and of course the arguments, as you well know, are about uh, a concern about the United States and Russia ending up in a cycle of escalation that could mean much more substantial bloodshed and and uh, heartbreak, you know, potentially for millions of people. So that. That is the short answer that you've heard before. But what President Zelensky said is, if not that, then give me the capabilities that will allow us uh, to be able to neutralize uh, Russian air power, Let, allow, allow us to take that weapon away. And so I think what you have seen from President Biden in the last few days is, uh, is his response to President Zelensky. And not just his, but that of the European Union, the United States and the European Union standing together and moving really quickly uh, in order uh, to put the Ukrainian military in a position where, again, they can neutralize any Russian air advantage that, that Putin would seek to, to obtain. So, again, I know the focus is on this very specific uh, idea, uh, but I think that what NATO has done is respond uh, to the functional need uh, of the Ukrainian military, as it's as it's been described uh, by the Ukrainian defense minister and by uh, President Zelensky.